where are the best prospects in the UFC five years ago now? When we talk about the prospects that we have coming up in mixed martial arts now, you look at Bo Nickel, you look at Peyton Talbot, we've all talked about them a thousand times, and there's kind of a sense of almost inevitability that those guys are going to become champions, that those guys are going to become really, really great UFC fighters. But this happens all the time. This happened last year, this happened five years ago, this happened 10 years ago, this happened 15 years ago. And sometimes these guys just truly will not plan out, whether it's injuries, whether it's that they're not as good as we actually thought they were. There will always be bust in the UFC, in the NBA, in the NFL, in the Premier League. It happens everywhere in every single sport. But before we get into it, make sure to like, sub all that YouTube shit. It really, really does help me out a ton. I know everybody asks, trust me, I know I know here it every single time, but Liking the videos, push it out to a ton more people, helps me out a lot, kind of like a virtual tip. And subscribing, obviously, I like to see the numbers go up a little bit. So let's get into it, though. Starting off number 10, we have Shajara Eubanks. And if you don't know that name right now, I cannot blame you at all. She's not exactly too active in the UFC right now. But Shajara Eubanks was on the semi-final of Tough when they were trying to find out it was going to be the inaugural women's 125-pound champion. She wins her semi-final, and then she has to withdraw from the final due to weight cut issues. And that was something that was going to plague her for the rest of her career. But even with those weight cut issues, even with her having to withdraw from the tough final obviously she still got into the UFC because they kind of had that you know unknown bit about her and she was 3-0 in 2018 she won her tough semi-final and then she beat Lauren Murphy and Roxanne Modaffery so she was kind of looking on the up and up and looking good and you're kind of wondering yourself where did she go 3-0 in women's MMA is different to men's MMA 3-0 was like one fight, two fights away from a title shot. It's like right up there at the top of the top. But then from there, we went downhill and it was those weight cut issues that kind of plagued her all the way through. From then, she was three and five in the UFC when she did make weight. She struggled to make weight all the time, constantly. And then eventually she was cut in 2023 after she missed weight once again. So she's almost one of those what ifs at women's 135 and my God, could women's 135 use the help right now? When you have Raquel Pennington as your champion, we're kind of looking at it and we're like, holy shit, bro, that division is so dead so maybe if Shajara Eubanks was a little bit little bit more dominant we could have seen her fill in a role at 135 be a good UFC fighter but if you can't make weight even at 135 for women's you're kind of screwed because it's not like you can just jump up another division. After that, we have Rayoni Barcelos. Rayoni Barcela, another MMA fighter from Brazil. You know, they're Brazilians. They got heritage and mixed martial arts. And for him, he was another tough winner. 4-0 up to 2020. So when you're 4-0 up to 2020, you know, you beat Kurt Holabaugh, who's been on tough, you know, more than once. He's been on tough twice now. Been a UFC fighter, veteran. And you can beat a guy like Said Nurmagomedov. Said Nurmagomedov, still today, that win holds up at 135. Still today, he's a contender 135 and that was right around Khabib and Islam where people were wondering if anybody with the second name Namagomedov can even be beat but since 2021 that's kind of where the fall off happened he's two and four since 2021 and bear in mind he has lost to really really good guys don't get it wrong he hasn't lost to any bums he's lost to Umar Namagomedov he's lost to Timur Valiev he just loves fighting fucking tough contestants Kurt Holabaugh, Timur Valiev, and he's lost to Kyler Phillips. Kyler Phillips trains with Sean O'Malley, one of Sean O'Malley's like top, top sparring partners. So another guy to look out for, another prospect. But Rowney Barcelos lost to him. So since 2021, he hasn't really been able to bounce back, but he is still in the UFC. He hasn't been cut from the UFC. He got a win against Christian Quinones in February 2024. So he's still kind of in and around that 135 pound division, but he definitely did not plan out to be what the UFC thought he was going to be here. After that, we have Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker was kind of like this crazy character back then that had this super, super unknown quantity about him. But when you can come into your UFC debut and knock out Khalil Roundtree Jr. in round one, and then your next two fights last a combined like 30 seconds with you getting a round one KO, and both of them, Dana White's eyes light up. He's like Brazilian, trains in Europe, trains with Conor McGregor. It's like, what the fuck? What can this guy not do? And he's getting knockouts for fun at light heavyweight at division that was kind of dead around then. So Dana White was so, so happy happy to see Johnny Walker inside the UFC, but it didn't go great for Johnny Walker. We all know Johnny Walker now, and don't get me wrong, has it gone badly for him? No, he's still maybe a top five, top six light heavyweight on the planet, so he's definitely not someone that has fallen off like the guys before, but Johnny Walker, after that hot streak when he was 3-0, and he's 4-5 and five since then, he's lost to Anka Live, he's lost to Jamal Hill, he's lost to Nikita Krylov, so he's losing to the best of the best. Don't get me wrong, he's losing to Magomed Anka Live, who I think could be a future time, Jamal Hill, who's a former champion, and Nikita Krylov, who's also a really, really good light heavyweight contender, and he's beat some good guys. He's beat Paul Craig, he's beat Anthony Smith, but if you're on a top 10 prospects list five years ago, do we think Johnny Walker has reached the heights that some of the other people on this list have? 
Most definitely not. After that, we have one that they hit on the head. I'm not going to lie to you, bro. This one could not have been any better from the UFC. When you're picking out prospects and you're like, what do we want the prospect to do? We want the prospect to maybe be like top five at least. If they could be a champion, that's great. If they can rack up some defenses, that's great. Weili Zhang is probably the pound for pound women's number one. Probably. You know, there's her, there's Alexa Grasso. Don't even throw Raquel Pennington's name into the conversation. I don't want to hear it. Okay, it's her or Alexa Grasso. And I'd probably lean towards Weili Zhang. People think that she could get all three belts in women's MMA. And I'm not too inclined to say that they're wrong. When you see how dominant she was against Yan Zhao Nan, she's looked really, really good. She was 5-0 inside the UFC, won her title. Everything was looking perfect. This prediction was looking unbelievable. But then she ran into Rose Namajunas, and Rose Namajunas is still the only person in the UFC to beat her, and Rose beat her twice, which is kind of crazy when we're thinking about it. But then Wei Li Zhang has bounced back, and she hasn't lost since then. But she still never got those victories back over Rose. She hasn't beat Rose. Rose has beat her twice, but she's beat pretty much everybody else in the division. This is a perfect A1 prediction from the UFC when we're looking at prospects. And they didn't really see that much out of her. It wasn't like it was a tapping from the UFC. She was just two for two in her first UFC fights then. After that, we have Brad Katona. Brad Katona's a real weird one. Another one that was on tough last year. And he hasn't really panned out to be what most people thought that he was going to be. Because he's the only two-time tough winner, I guess. He won tough twice. He won it in that year. He won tough. And he won tough in 2023 with Conor McGregor and Michael Chandler. But when he got into the UFC, he was kind of a little bit hard done by. I'm going to be honest. Because, you know, he won a fight. Then he lost to Merab. He lost another fight. And then he got cut. Being one and two in the UFC and getting cut. It's kind of crazy, especially if you're a tough winner, if you showed potential, and he might have the weirdest accent in all of mixed martial arts, that kind of Canadian and Irish accent just blends up so unbelievably weirdly. But he's back in the UFC now again, after going on a super long wing streak, getting back into tough, going through tough, winning the tournament, and he's one and one in the UFC right now. Lost his most recent fight, fight at 135. Brad Katona, has he lived up to the hype? I'm going to say no, especially when you're placed ahead of Wei Li Zhang and what Wei Li Zhang's done inside the UFC. I can't say that Brad Katona's lived up to what he was meant to be at 135. After that, we have one that definitely did live up to the hype and lived up to the hype and more. We have two guys at that number five slot. The first one, though, is Pyotr Yan. Pyotr Yan came into UFC and it was a little bit of a weird thing because we saw him and he was like knocking people out, but they weren't the greatest. And we were like, how good is this guy? You know, we kind of need a litmus test for Pyotr Yan. Because in 2018, 2019, when they were looking at him right here, showing off world-class striking, a solid ground game, and has a mean streak going three for three with two knockouts. But we didn't really get to see Pyotr Jan against that top-level competition. So there was always that question in our head. But when he faced them, when he faced the best of the best, he shined. He beat Uriah Faber. He beat Jose Aldo. He beat Jimmy Rivera, who was a really, really good 135er back then. And he went on to win a UFC title. He then lost it to Aljo via DQ. A little bit annoying. Doesn't get the defense that we wanted him to get. But I think right now he's criminally underrated mixed martial arts. I think he's really, really underrated as a UFC fighter because lost that DQ to Aljo, lost to Sean O'Malley in a close ass decision. And we're seeing what Sean O'Malley's doing in mixed martial arts right now. But I think he's very, very underrated. Picked apart Song Yudong. I'd be very interested in seeing Pyotr Yannick and Sean O'Malley too. After that, with Pyotr Yan, we have Sadiq Yusuf. Sadiq Yusuf hasn't quite lived up to what Pyotr Yan has lived up to. Don't get me wrong, he's not bad. He's not bad. But when you're tied with Pyotr Yan, we look at like where those two careers have gone. Pyotr Yan was 7-0 inside the UFC when he got his UFC title. Sadiq Yusuf, he was 4-0 up to 2021, so they were kind of, you know, on par with each other, and it was like, holy shit, both of these guys are going to be great. They just went A1 and A1 with both of their predictions, but he's 2-3 and three since then, and it's kind of one of those things where, in my head, I have Pyotr Jan and Sadiq Yusuf swapped. I was sure that Sadiq Yusuf was going to be the next big thing, that he was going to grab a title, and Pyotr Jan might have been fraud checked by those elite of the elite guys. It was completely flipped. Sadiq Yusuf, his losses have all been to the elite of the elite. He's lost to Arnold Allen, he's lost to Edson Barbosa, and then he's lost to Diego Lopez, obviously a UFC 300. So he's one of the guys that's kind of turned out to be a gatekeeper, whereas Pyotr Jan is top of the line. He's probably top three, top five at 135 right now, depending on how you're ranking it. Then we move up to the four spot and we have Macy Barber. I'm always a big fan of fighters when they go on a bit of a law streak and then they're able to rebound and they're able to, you know, come back and show that they're even better because everybody looks good when they're up. You know what I mean? Everybody looks good when they're seven and oh and they're a prodigy and everybody's saying that they're really good. But how can you do when you get on that win streak and then come back and you take a few losses? You take, you know, one, two, three losses in a row. And Macy Barber has showed that because she was was 3-0 inside the UFC was one of those like super young people that people were saying could have broke John Jones's record as a champion especially you know we we're talking about women's MMA how quick it is to get a title shot 
And then she took two losses. One of them was to Alexa Grasso before we knew who Alexa Grasso was. And then the other one was to Roxanne Madafri, which kind of puts you in a weird spot because you're three and two inside the UFC. Everybody was hyping you up to be this, you know, new contender for the women. And then you take two losses. And it's like, how can you bounce back after those two losses? And she has bounced back. She's bounced back really, really well. She's been 6-0 and since then, gone flawless since then. So she's turned a 3-2 and record where people were like, did she get fraud checked? To a 9-2 and record where now we're looking and we're like, yeah, no, okay, she's one of the next up people in women's MMA. She's almost guaranteed to hold the title at some point. She's got to fight against Rose Nami Yunus next, so that should be super, super fun and is a litmus test against a UFC champion, a UFC Hall of Famer on the women's side. After that, we have another woman. It's Mackenzie Dern. Mackenzie Dern shocked people when she first came into the UFC because you see how good her jujitsu is. You saw that she was able to impose herself on anybody and everybody that she fought. But the problem for her is the striking. And it's been a problem the entire way through. Nobody thought in 2018, 2019 that she was going to be this crazy, crazy striker. And she just hasn't been able to put it together. She's been 8-5 and five in the UFC, 0-2 in her last two. And one of her biggest problems for me is that she dropped Jason Perillo, Jason Perillo's Cheeto Veras coach. And her striking didn't look bad. With him as her coach, her striking looked like it was kind of, you know, leveling up, taking a few steps. And she wasn't going to be Sean O'Malley. She wasn't going to go out there and all of a sudden be a world-class striker. But it looked like it was getting better. It looked like it might hold up against some of the better strikers inside the UFC. But when she left him, it just hasn't been the same. It hasn't been great. Once again, 0-2 in the last two, 8-5 in the UFC. Definitely hasn't held up to that number three spot yet. Speaking of not holding up, next we have Alexander Hernandez. Alexander Hernandez, I can 100% understand why they put him here. When we look at Alexander Hernandez and what he did, think about Benil Dariush's prime. When he was on that win streak, Alexander Hernandez gets called up short notice to fight him. The fight of Benil Dariush in 2018. We saw how good he is in 2023 when he was that little bit older, when he was 37. Think about how good he would have been when he was 32. Comes in short notice. Everybody thinks, oh yeah, it's just a walkover for Benny. He's going to go in there. He's going to smoke him and knocks him out in 42 seconds, a 42 second KO. And then he goes on, he wins his next fight. And as you can see right here, they say in January, he's got another big assignment in the form of Donald Cowboy Cerrone. I'm sad to say for Alexander Hernandez, that fight did not go his way. And he was 2-0 in 2019, came in short notice, everything was good for him. Then he got KO'd by Donald Cowboy Cerrone. And he's been 4-7 and seven since that little win streak that he's been on. So we scroll through the last few before we get to the number one. You have Alexander Hernandez, Mackenzie Dern, Macy Barber, Sadiq Yusuf. Some have panned out, some haven't. And when you look towards the top half, you have Sadiq Yusuf, Macy Barber, Mackenzie Dern. They're not as good as the Whaley Zhangs, the Pyotr Yans, the Johnny Walkers that we had towards the back of the crew. So who is the number one guy in... It's someone that definitely panned out. It's Israel Adesanya. They hit this one S+. Plus, one of the best fighters in UFC history, and you picked him out as your number one guy. Bear in mind, this wasn't Israel Adesanya who fought nobody. This was a little bit of a tapping, okay? But nobody could have predicted to see what he would have actually done a middleweight at 185. At this point, he had beat Rob Wilkinson, Marvin Vittori before he was a huge contender, Brad Tavares, and then Derek Brunson was kind of the fight where we looked at and we went, yeah, okay, he's legit. He's serious. People were kind of looking at him at this point to be like, where can he line up in strikers in the UFC? Is he a top five striker in the UFC? How good can he be inside the UFC? And oh my God, was he good. Israel Adesanya is undoubtedly a UFC Hall of Famer, the number two 185 pounder ever. Obviously beat Robert Whitaker, beat Marvin Vittori, beat anybody and everybody at 185. Had one of the greatest rivalries in UFC history with Alex Pereira. Tried to get his double champ status, didn't really work him against Jan Blakovic. But this is an A1 prediction from the UFC to have Israel Adesanya as your number one guy and for him to turn out to be a GO contender at 185. Yeah. This was pretty perfect from the UFC. So all in all, you have some guys that panned out really, really well, some flops, and some people that kind of landed in around the middle. But that is the top five prospects from five years ago. Where are they now? Make sure to like, sub, dot, dot, YouTube, shit, and I'll catch you boys tomorrow. Peace.